Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are celebrating the end of the school year uh, with our school garden workshop. We like to do this annually and um, have different speakers on different topics, uh, supporting uh, the different types of activities and things you'd like to know um, when you have a school garden or when you garden with youth. And so thank you for joining us um, today. This morning, we're starting the event with Randy Penn. He is our waste reduction uh, agent. And um, so he talks on composting, vermiculture, um, plastic reduction, all sorts of things. And he was kind enough to join us this morning to talk about composting and vermiculture. And uh, if you have questions, you as we go along, you'll be welcome to put them right in the chat box. And um, it, and or raise your hand if for some reason you can't access the chat. And we are gonna go till 10 o'clock this morning, then we'll have a half hour break and then we'll go into the show and tell with our teacher speakers. Um, and the agenda is right behind me. If you are needing something emailed to you uh, about the agenda or links, just put it in the chat for me. And Randy, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I'm really looking forward to learning. I don't know much about vermiculture. So I'm really looking forward to that part. Okay, well, well, thank you. I do the composting, waste reduction programs, a lot of recycling uh, related programs um, here at the extension. One thing I'd like to know is just if you could get into the chat and type in, you know, just, you know, why you're attending today, whether you're an educator, um, kind of what you're looking to get out of, of the lessons today, so just so I can get an idea of who the audience is here a little bit, because I have some things geared to schools. And so that's kind of going to be my focus on, on kind of adapting it to schools. But I'd like to just get a sense of that as we go along. And if you have questions, I have the chat open and I'll answer those as well. We have a small group, so I'll be able to kind of monitor that. Um, you know, today I just want to talk first a little bit about just the, the whole issue of food waste. Um, it's a big issue, not just here locally, but across the state, uh, nationally as well. Um, then I want to focus, you know, specifically on composting and some composting projects that we're doing. Um, we'll transition over to the vermiculture and vermiculture projects, and then just kind of a discussion. Uh, I'll share with you some of the resources we have, some of the opportunities. Um, that we can do to put into your different programs. It looks like we have a couple teachers here, some master gardeners, um, some school volunteers. So um, perfect. I even see a middle school there. We have a middle school program. So we'll be able to, that's perfect. All right. Thank you for doing that. You know, one, one thing that um, I was talking with Mindy about this actually yesterday is I am actually back in school. I started working on a, a doctoral program in education. And, you know, it's really interesting. I'm reading a lot of theory, right? Bruner and Tyler and Dewey, the, these kind of, you know, kind of uh, hundred year old curriculum theory. So, but one of the things I've noticed in these patterns is, is what's been successful is in active learning, right? Something that the children or anyone really can experience. And I think the, that food waste, composting, vermiculture really lends itself well to being a hands-on type activity um, rather than just your standard classroom test with that. So, so, when I, so as you go through, I think that's kind of how I tried to adapt this it, to, to the, the different programs you have is to really think about how we can make it hands-on. The other thing is I have to read these kind of studies. And one of my professors gave me a study about a teacher's uh, tour group in St. Augustine, where they go out and experience different historical sites. And they did an evaluation of this. And a lot of the feedback came back from the people who attended, the teachers, and they found it, you know, anyone who comes in as a guest speaker, you know, it was most successful if they could find a way to adapt it best to the programs um, of the teachers and really relate it to them. So I'm going to try my best to do that today. And, and, and make it worth our while, you know, to show you how food waste and composting can be utilized as an active learning thing and how we can adapt it to multiple areas within your curriculum and what you're doing. So kind of starting off with food, food waste here, you know, I like this slide from the Department of Agriculture. 
Um, and it really highlights that issue of food waste in, in three ways. It's excessive, it's expensive, and it's environmentally harmful. You know, and this is something you can bring into your lessons when, whether it's at youth, a youth level or all the way to retirees. And I, and I do that with my classes here. And I talk about how we waste 40% of all the food produced here in the United States. We produce this excess weight of 133 billion pounds. This is obviously at a tremendous cost, you know, both on the agricultural side, but also economically. And then there are these environmental impacts. So lots of ways to approach the issue of food waste um, from an educational side. Um, just to put a visual out there for those visual learners, you know, set, we, we throw enough food waste away to, in the United States to fill 730 stadiums a, a year. So that's twice a day. We're filling up the swamp. Uh, in Gainesville with food waste, you know, every day for an entire year. So it's a lot of food waste with a big, big impact um, on the country. Kind of bringing it a little bit closer to home, you know, we really are interested in, the, in food waste and the food waste impacts, um, largely because of our recycling programs here across the state. You know, back in 2008, they put a, uh, a bill in place to reach a 75% target threshold by the year 2020. Um, we passed that, um, that date and we only came up about 50%. It was actually 49% as a statewide recycling rate. Um, in Sarasota, we have a 51% rate. Um, but this is something you could look into as far as recycling within your classrooms of what is the recycling rate in your area? Um, you know, what's your county recycling rate? And you can look at a lot of the different methods that you're using there locally. Uh, a large part of that um, that we throw away is food waste. It's about 14% of the uh, waste that we throw away. So that's why food waste is such a big, big issue um, across the state. Oh. Um, 25% of what we throw away is organic waste right? And uh, that's, that's what goes into the landfill. And these are things that can be recycled, right? So if we really want to improve our recycling rates and improve our, our uh, numbers across the state, we have to consider organics as part of that recycling um, in our program. And there's kind of the breakdown of the residential weight and the commercial weight. So um, this is something we focus on a lot. Um, so a lot of people don't think of food waste and composting in the sense of, of re a recyclable material, but it certainly can align with any sort of recycling programs you have um, at your schools or at, within your programs. Uh, I think a lot of uh, the, the curriculum we do bases around environmental impacts. What happens when we th throw food waste away? Or what happens when we produce all this excess food? Well, it's a drain on our natural resources. There's a lot of oil and gas production that goes in to transporting the food, storing the food, shipping the food, all these type of things that ties in with fossil fuels and, and, and the impacts on the environment in that way. And then there's these landfill impacts that maybe aren't quite that interesting to, to students, but they're part of it as well. You know, how much are we throwing away and all the, all the impacts from sludge and burning of waste that we have. Also tied in with the composting and, and food waste is biogas. Um, locally in Sarasota, we actually capture our methane at the landfill and turn it from a waste to energy type program. Um, and so these, this is a really cool thing we do at the extension um, is talk about biogas and that process of anaerobic digestion. Um, you know, there's two primary biogases that are produced with food waste, and those are carbon dioxide and methane. I know a lot of the science programs now are focusing in on, on climate related issues. Uh, as part of the STEM program. So this really directly goes into there. You know, as we throw things away into the landfill, there are these gases that produce impacts. What are the impacts? Well, right now, 18% of all our emissions, methane emissions come from landfills. And that is from that organic waste breaking down. Uh-oh, time out, my dog's coming in. <laughs> Got a guess. Um, working at the house, you always have the, that kind of happen. Um, the other impact that, that ties into this, if, if you're doing something along the lines uh, of a social component, right? 
of what's happening locally in, in to families, right? So wasting food, the typical family will throw away $1,500 a year of food. You know, there's a tremendous waste with that on the individual level. It also impacts our farmers, right? You can see in the chart here on the orange line, it's kind of dropping subtly down to about 14 cents per dollar. And that's the amount that farmers get of all the food when they produce and sell it. That has been dropping a trend over the last several decades. Uh, the farmers aren't receiving as much for the amount that they're producing. So when you have a system that's wasting 40% of all the food, it's very inefficient. And those inefficiencies, you know, it usually comes back to the grower who's going to face a lot of those, those costs and, and those problems. So, um, you know, lots of different ways to kind of look at that kind of general issue of food waste. It's not just the diversion and the composting side, but we can also look at it from a sustainability side. You know, that people, profit, planet, environmental, economic, and the social components within your classroom. So there's lots of different uh, ways to look at it um, from a lesson plan, not just on the science type of side of things. All right, so um, just, just a question, you know, what do you think of when, I, when we talk composting, right? You know, what is composting? Um, you know, that's gonna be generally what we're gonna do today. And I'll also ask you to put in the chat is anyone currently composting at your schools, at your business, at uh, within any of your programs right now? I, I'd like to kind of hear that too, um, just to see kind of your experience level with composting as we go. And I'll kind of watch the chat there. Wilma's composting at home. Of course she is. I know that, Wilma. Uh, <laughs> um, so as I kind of go, I just want to explain a little bit of some of the things that of that active learning component that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, you know, I at the extension, I have a class called Let's Make Some Black Gold. And what we do is we start off with a kind of a lesson that I just went through about the impacts of food waste and then what I'm going to take you through here next. And then we quickly go outside and we just start building piles. Um, you know, it's a hands-on activity. It helps people understand the process a little bit better and all the impacts kind of get, get really, you can really focus on the different things. You know, you can focus on that issue of food waste, learn the basics of compost, how to build the pile, screen the compost, and then ultimately we'll even do some vermiculture and biogas with it as well. Um, so here, for those of you who put some things into the, um, chat here. It's going really fast, Mindy, so you might have to help me out there. Um, it, composting is defined as the controlled decomposition of organic matter uh, by microorganisms. Basically, we're mimicking what happens in nature with organic material, and we're doing it in a controlled setting, a bin, some kind of tumbler or, or a uh, pallet type system or a geo bin. And what we're going to do is we balance out our browns, which are going to be our carbon rich material, with that of greens, which is going to be our food waste. Um, and, we're, and why do we do it? We do it to fertilize, create a fertilizer, condition our soils. And I know they're going to talk a lot about that with the garden side of this later. And, but also we divert that food waste from the landfill, or we, what I like to say, we recycle it. Here's kind of a visual for those visual learners. We have the browns plus the greens plus the water plus the air when we turn our compost and it will attract those macroorganisms, which are kind of those worms, those insects, those, uh, you know, those sow bugs and millipedes and all those type of fun, fun little critters. But also it attracts microorganisms, which does the actual work or the majority of the work breaking down that compost. Um, for those of you who kind of are teaching maybe more at a, a middle school or even a higher level, you can even start to explore, you know, the classes of bacteria um, and really dig into that a little bit deeper and what's going on in that process. You know, there's three main classes of bacteria that break down the compost. You know, that we have the cycros, the meso, and the thermophilic bacteria, and they all operate at different temperatures. 
Uh, most of the work's done by the mesophilic bacteria there in the middle, number two, that's in that 68 to 113 range. So you can monitor your, your piles as they heat up um, with a temperature gauge and really track and see um, what's happening here. You know, why is our, our, our pile going from 80 to 90 to 100 to 105 degrees? Well, it's these bacteria that are in there making this happen. And when you get to higher temperatures, you can even look at these thermophilic bacteria, which are the same ones that actually are seen in the geysers in Yellowstone operating and creating those colors. So there's a lot of things you can do on that side, and we're willing to kind of um, help you with that. And I have some resources with that I'll share at the end um, to show you with, with some of the things you can do on that higher end science. Another thing we do is we, we did a project a year ago, or maybe two years ago, uh, where we had uh, residents record and track their food waste that they were diverting and composting every month. They sent me a, a link and said, oh, I've diverted 20 pounds this month, and we, we would track it for a year. And um, I think this is something that can be really adapted to schools that are able to compost or do vermiculture is to kind of just don't put your food in, in there and divert it, maybe track and weigh it, you know, um, you know, create a spreadsheet or a, some sort of board in your, in your room. It says, okay, every week we are diverting 10 pounds or 20 pounds and see how you're doing and see how that breaks down. It adds a little bit more of that data collection in, in, into the program and just kind of makes it more of a science project or a research-based project rather than just, you know, kind of making compost and, and not thinking about the process behind it. But it was a very successful project we ran. We found that every, the ho average household did just around 19 pounds per household per month, which adds up really quick when you have, you know, 200,000 plus households across, across the county, it would be a, a significant amount. The other thing you can look at is your events. Right, we're all doing different kind of meetings, um, different types of you know, uh, kind of uh, events like we did here. We go out to Benderson Park uh, and we do education and food waste collection at our rowing events. Now, this is a large scale type project that we do there, but certainly can be scaled down to adapt to anything that you're doing. Um, you know, whether it's a, a youth camp, you can look to try to make them more zero waste and kind of kind of reduce that <clears throat> or you can just simply collect some food waste like we did here um, we actually pack it in mulch like uh, mulch bins and uh, and we break it down on site and compost it on site and we track and measure and collect that data and we're able to say you know we diverted 200 pounds of food waste from this event and what is the environmental impact of that well that is the equivalent of x amount of CO2 diverted from the landfill or something like that. So you can always put a number or some kind of uh, uh, different type of uh, metric on it. Um, we're happy to help you with those. If you have any interest, I do come out to a lot of different um, sites and help them do on-site composting and different uh, things like that. So if you have uh, one of those, feel free to reach out with me. Um, we can get you up and running for that. But think about the, the events you do. You know, how do we make them a little greener and put a lesson around it? So I'm gonna stop there uh, and see if we can answer some of these questions here, Mindy, um, about composting before we kind of move into the vermicomposting and some of the lectures. So um, I wanted to recap um, after Wilma shared that she composts at home and I know we're not surprised by that. Um, we had some folks sharing where they're composting, and it looks like um, folks if, have started composting at home and or at their school. Um, some of the impediments they are hitting is, um, you know, a concern of like, you know, could composting attract a rodent, that type of thing. Um, and, and do you have suggestions for that? Yeah, you know, I've gone to a number of schools and they wanted to put composting in at some level, whether it was just a single class or a larger scale problem. And, and ultimately it comes to that exact issue, Mindy, is going to attract pests, it's going to attract rats and, and who's going to maintain it, right? So those are, those are certainly concerns, especially on the administration type level that we hear. Um, but if you are actively 
if number one, if you're putting the correct ingredients in, in the right balance, um, I always say over pack it with the mulch and the brown material just to put, be on the safe side. And, and number two, you know, you need to maintain and turn it correctly. If you're actively out there turning, incorporating your composting in, you won't have problems with that. They're probably more likely those rats and rodents are, are going to be in the dumpsters uh, where you're normally would be throwing the food waste away or throwing away the meat and all that other stuff. Um, but it is, a, it is a concern and it's something we definitely address with, uh, with you if we come out to the school and talk, because I know that's always a concern. You know, start small, start manageable and, and really learn your process first before doing that. Um, there are a few schools doing active programs right now uh, around the county here, which is great to see. But I, you know, even just bringing in the, the issue into the classroom and the curriculum, I think has, has just as much impact as, as, as the diverting it. Um, and thank you for those tips. I think they're helpful. And I know a lot of the schools usually have pine needles and oak leaves and things that are um, pretty accessible uh, for the Browns. So that's great. Okay, so, yeah, and, and, and any more questions? feel free to type them in there as we kind of move along. Sure. One quick question for you, Randy. Does this mean you're open to site visits and or other kind of consultations for schools that are in our Sarasota area? Yes. Yep. I, vis I visited a number of schools just to kind of see where they're, a big part of it, site selection, where are they going to put the compost, the type of system, and we can kind of talk through some of the things that I've seen that maybe have worked and haven't worked and kind of move you move you further along the, the learning curve um, so that, that you're ready to go right out of the gate. Uh, the, other, the other program we're really starting to dive more into is vermicomposting. Um, and we're starting to, uh, we just, we're getting ready to go back live here with classes. And I've got lots and lots of people signed up around the county that people are really, really interested in vermicomposting, which is composting using worms, right? Um, and, and really, earthworms are great to use um, because, uh, but it's a different process. I want people to understand it's different than traditional composting. We're not doing a mixture of brown carbon material and the food waste and, we, and raising temperatures to break it down and attracting organisms. With the vermiculture, we don't wanna add those browns in there. We don't wanna add a large amount of that kind of carbon material because that'll create higher temperatures and worms don't really like the higher temperatures, right? They live down in the ground where it's cooler. We wanna to try to keep those temperatures, you know, 70 degrees uh, around there or even lower if possible. But if you start getting 85, 90 type degrees, they're, they're not going to do so well and, uh, and you're going to run into some troubles. Uh, but vermi, you know, comes from the Latin word, means uh, vermis and worms, right? Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about the worms you want to use. And this, the, these were great in classrooms because you can put them into um, small, small bins and small spaces, but you have to use the right worms. You know, there are, you know, over 9,000, I've seen even numbers higher than that. There, there are, you know, thousands and thousands of species of worms, and we really don't want to just go out and use any worm to, to, to do the process. Um, the main one are going to be known as this Esenia phytida, right? Or fetia, uh, senia fetia, um, but more common, they are known as red wigglers. Uh, and actually, they're really small worms. They're only a couple of inches in size, um, and they seem to work the best and have been widely adapted by vermiculture really across the country here. Um, you can order them online pretty easily, uh, lots of different places to get them. Uh, but there are a couple other ones that I've experimented with, actually, Mindy, uh, in my bins at, at, um, at the office there. I have used some African night crawlers. I have used some, uh, I haven't used the Indian blue worms there, but I have used some different ones, Alabama jumpers, which really didn't work too well. They seem to kind of get out and go away. But the, the most successful by far has been those red wiggler worms. <laughs> 
So you're saying the jumpers came by their name pretty well. They, they, they actually do. They're, they're, they're usually about four or five inches long and they just wiggle and go crazy. They're fun for the kids to work with, but they don't, uh, they're, they're not the best. They don't really, they don't um, reproduce as quickly as the red wigglers do. That's one nice thing. If you look at the picture on the right there, you can see how small they are in the, in the hand there. They're just, you know, real, real, real tiny. And, uh, and they, they can reproduce very, very quickly. Uh, and, and you can get a lot, and they break down the food. They actually ball up on top. So if you put a banana peel in there, inside your bin, you'll notice they clump around it and break it down. And when they break that food waste down, what they, what they poop out is castings. We call them castings. And that's that, that nitrogen rich material that we're after. Um, a lot of people worry, and I get a lot of questions, whether they're invasive, the red wigglers, and what happens when they get out in our environment or kind of escape. Um, not really a big problem. Um, they're going to stay in your bin for the most part. They like that environment. Um, our soils are very sandy, and they don't like that type type of uh, you know that that type of environment. So they stay right there in your bin, and you're going to have a closed bin when you do this. So don't worry too much about you know causing some sort of sort of, sort of invasive uh, type species outbreak or anything like that. They're perfectly fine to use uh, for our for a mount. Um, you know, our, I always like to bring this as some of the questions we ask when we go into the classroom, you know, you know, why are worms wet, you know, well, because they breathe through their skin, they need to stay, you know, damp and, and, and moist. Um, um, so if you are working with wind, uh, worms, one of the things we'll do is I have a, uh, a curriculum that I'll share with you later that you can actually pull the worms out and you put them on a little plate and you can have them measure the worm look at which direction the worm's going, all these sort of things, but you got to make sure you have water bottles there to kind of spray on them and, and, and keep them uh, nice and damp. And, and they don't like the light either. You know, do they have eyes, eyes and ears? Well, no, they do not. And one way we, you know, work with the students there is we can tell which way, uh, you know, how they move in the light and, and, and different things. And you can make a lot of experiments and kind of jot down on uh, as far as a kind of a lab project. Do they have noses? No, they don't have noses. Um, do they have mouths and teeth? Hmm, good question, right? Well, yes, they have a mouth, but they do not have teeth, right? So these are the type of things we can go through with our lesson plans and do uh, work with. We're going to be doing some of this with our youth camps, actually. It's a really popular um, project when you bring the worms in. Kind of a, a, a funny story. I had to go do a youth camp. I was actually, you know, kindergartner to maybe second grade, but I had to stop and do a presentation at a, uh, a medical graduate course. So these, these people are getting their doctorate degrees and they're getting ready to start their practices. And so I go and I speak to them about, you know, sustainable practices and things to consider from the medical perspective as they go out and start their, their businesses. And I had, you know, I actually had the worms with me because I didn't want them to get too hot in the car. And someone brought up composting and vermiculture. So I went and got my worms, brought it out, put it in the middle of the room. And, and the whole class suddenly got interested in what I was saying for the first time, right? Everyone was engaged in the process, uh, talking about the worms, holding the worms and things like that. Same things happens when I go into a kindergartner room. So one thing I, I found is whether you're with five-year-olds or 95-year-olds, the worms work. They love them. They, it's a great thing to bring into the classroom um, and lots of different things you can do around it. Um, you know, I, I have some bins and we're going to be starting some classes to build bins. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do them. We, we like to use kind of a, you know, a stackable system. Uh, but the main thing is, you, you know, to have a, a good, strong uh, Rubbermaid type container um, with those and they have to have good air. They're living creatures, so you need to be, make sure to do that. Um, this is a great classroom activity that you can do. I'm going to be, like I mentioned, doing some vermiculture live type classes. So this might be a good way to come and go through the process with us. And then you can take it back to your classroom. Um, related to that. And if you need bins and things like that, we could probably come up with a way to get you guys bins 
um, that you can use uh, and take back. I probably even have some worms I can give you too um, if you wanna get started doing some vermiculture and we'll take you through that process of how to get it going. Um, here's some examples of schools that have started vermiculture. You know, McIntosh Middle has that, um, that agricultural program that's been pretty successful. We actually use the, uh, those, are, those bins are the recycled containers that they used to take our dual stream recycling in that you had to turn back in or you may have laying around. Um, and we actually use those, put holes in them, and we're, we're using two different types of worms in 30 stackable units. And we have them all under shade and under cover. We're using the red wigglers on half and the night crawlers on another half. Um, it's for that middle school age. And it's really great because they have they can use um, stuff from their agricultural program as the food to feed them. They even use some of the uh, they have uh, rabbits there so they can put some of the droppings in there, which are great to break down with. Um, so they do a little bit of that, but they do not they have not had success with taking it from the cafeteria. So I know that's kind of the dream to. For a lot of schools is divert food waste from the cafeteria and but they we, we didn't go down that route um, we're going to slowly start working with the break room and try to get some of the teachers involved with the coffee grounds that they have in there and some of their food waste and bringing that out so that's kind of our entry point to get some get the school side involved is to go through that but this has been a pretty cool program and those bins work awesome because they're so strong versus the rubber made tend to break down after a while. I think they're kind of flimsy and these are these are really great to use. Yeah, somebody said there's plenty of cardboard at school. So yeah, you, you, you actually can use uh, shredded paper in here, newspapers. That's their bedding is going to be made out of that material that's nice and damp. So rather than putting a bunch of mulch in there, you actually use some nice damp material like that. I like to take the cardboard and kind of put that on top or get that a little bit wet because they'll, they'll start to break down that material as well. So there's, there's plenty of stuff like that that you can use with the vermiculture. Um, you know, just like we talked about it with composting supporting local events, you can do it the same thing with um, the vermiculture. Uh, one of the things we do is we support our county events with sustainable type, uh, you know, diverting the, the food waste and the compostable wares. That's a big thing now. We're trying to move away from single use plastics in, in, our, uh, in our programs. And one of the ways is to get those compostable or paper plates. And the worms can break those down a little bit. I still haven't found a good way to get those plastic, those compostable forks to break down. They don't seem to ever do it, but for some of the plates and things like that, they will break down that material a little bit. So it acts really nice uh, to do. And that's just a picture of one of the larger bins that I use um, for vermiculture. And you can see how kind of rich and dark it is. It produces a really beautiful um, material there. Uh, from their castings, the pH tends to be a little bit higher on vermiculture than it does with the regular compost. And then there's, we can do maturity tests with you. We have uh, some kits that we can give you to see um, if it's ready, if it, if, and, and, and you can do little experiments on, on that as well, do a little soil type composition type test. Here's some more just events that we support, you know, put your bins out at, the, at, at your events that you do. This is a 4-H radish program. You know, we collect that food waste from the judging because they can't use them for anything. Everyone's been handling it. And we add it right into our vermiculture bins and our composting as well. And we incorporate that in there and they're able to break down that material. So, you know, just kind of think about, you know, in your, in, in your, throughout your year, if, you, is, if there's some opportunities like that to bring in some composting, food waste collection, vermiculture into it. I, I think it's a good way to start and get the ball rolling and learn to do it. And a lot of people will go, well, what are those bins over there? You know, what's going on with those bright orange composting bins that I, that I use? And it's a great conversation starter to get people interested in composting. So I wanted to bring in some resources here uh, and I'll, I'll kind of drag some over. Hopefully I'm able to do this successfully here. Uh, Mindy, as we go in, I mentioned our classes and on the left, those are all the classes I do. They're on Eventbrite. You can sign up and they range from the composting black gold 
to the issues of food waste, recycling correctly, even reducing plastics comes into play with the compostable wares and, and adapts really well. Um, green business type programs. And of course, Minnie and I do a community gardens and composting kind of program together. And then we have a lot of online resources. I know all of us spent in way, way too much time online. And so I wanted to kind of show you a little bit of those. Let me see if I can drag this in here. Um, onto my screen there. So this is, this is our, um, hopefully you can see that okay. The first thing I have here is our YouTube page. So if you go to UFI Fist, Sarasota County, we have a fantastic YouTube page with lots of resources and videos based along your topics. So you can kind of scroll down, um, look for gardening and landscaping. There's some videos to show, natural resources, um, healthy living, sustainability as a thing. So that's a, one really good resource you can kind of go through and, and look and find some videos and, and different shorts that might work really well for you. A lot of stuff uh, for marine and coastal type environments. And then we have a really successful program that uh, Dr. Clements runs at our place and we all participate in. It's called our LIFE program, Learning in Florida's Environment. Again, it's that active learning approach. Um, we usually go out to the parks and, and do programs there, but while we were quarantined, we did create a lot of programs related to um, recycling, composting, all those sort of things. Like here's one of my videos that's uh, right on the page here. So you can kind of just click on that. And one of the things that's great is it actually has a lesson and an activity built into the end of it, you know? For, for whatever the... Uh... Welcome, we are here to talk about learning in Florida's environment, which is the LIFE program. And I'm Dr. Catherine, and I'm here at UF IFAS Extension, Sarasota County, with Agent Randy, our waste reduction agent. He's gonna talk to us today about food waste and utilizing it for compost and even renewable energy. Welcome to our compost learning center. We're here to talk about food waste today and re all right I'll stop that I don't want to watch myself on camera anymore but you get the idea that that learning in Florida's environment works really really well and there's lots of great topics you can use there another thing I have given Mindy a number of resources it's going to be on a, a zip drive I think she can email it to you and you're going to have two different uh, folders one will be on composting one will be on worms um, you know so you have lots of different um resources in here from just facts about worms, uh, programs for kids, um, some more scientific EDIS type stuff, which is a little bit more a higher level type stuff. So lots of different things you can do, especially on the worm side. Um, in there as well, you're going to have a, a thing that has lots of links in one of those. It'll show you all kinds of different programs you can do um, that are happening around the country. That, that you can adapt to your programs. And then I also, an, an example of one of those might be if you wanted to do on-site composting in your school and you wanted to get some ideas, this is from the Vermont uh, Department of Conservation up there. And you can kind of see they have it laid out in about 15 pages, all the different steps, you know, a checklist you can go through and they'll even have different programs and ways you can incorporate those into education. So a lot of good resources I tried to give you um, to kind of get you a good sense of what's going on uh, and get you started if you're kind of curious of some things. Uh, we also have a program I, I put in there about what's cycling in the biosphere. And this is one that we've done as a, a bunch of the agents partnered up for our eighth graders. And we look at decomposition, plant, plants, carbon, nutrition, and take them through kind of that life cycle of, of what's happening with our, with our uh, biosphere. And this is myself with our biogas unit. And also at the top there, there's some students working with our uh, active learning programs, learning about food waste and composting. Uh, I would also say look, some, some little steps you can do just at home or even within your school is look to be start a green team, start a program, you know, of, of some of the different teachers or educators. Um, you can look to become a green partner, which is a program that I run. Your school or organization could become a green business. And that's a great program to kind of work through different steps with recycling, um, waste reduction, water conservation, 
even energy is tied into that as well. Um, look to remove those single use plastics in all of your different events where possible. You know, start with your break rooms and then bring them into the classrooms. Try to get rid of all that all that excess plastic that we've been using way too much of over the, over the last year. Um, we've created kits actually that people can use for re reusable uh, water totes and, and dishware. Uh, and then maybe look to recycle another product. I know at our office, uh, I put up a station to collect, you know, plastic films uh, from packaging from Amazon and all, all those sorts of things. It's amazing how much of that piles up. I, that, I fill up that that bin and within a week or two, it seems like. And then I take that back to Publix and just drop that off. I also do electronics, do the printer ink, and we do for food waste as well at our place. So there might be some opportunities to expand and improve your recycling uh, at your schools. I know that is a big challenge at many schools. I've been to a lots and lots of meetings at school recycling. Um, so, you know, keep, keep up and keep at it. I know that can be challenging with, uh, you know, lots of people in a, in, a, in a space moving through quickly, it kind of gets uh, lost in the shuffle sometimes. So those are some things you can do uh, to improve recycling. And I'm happy to kind of come in and help you do that as well. And with that, I think that's all I have, Mindy. I've talked way too long, way too fast. Um, <laughs> hopefully that's somewhat helpful, but I'm here to answer any questions you might have. I'll check the chat here. But the main thing, there's my contact information. It's rpen at ufl.edu. Shoot me an email or go contact Mindy and I'm happy to come out and help, you know, set up composting programs, set up vermiculture, you know, or even just bring it into the classroom and get kind of the ball rolling with different types of projects and education. There, there's lots you can do. It's highly adaptable to multiple lessons and multiple touch points, you know, along that sustainability kind of tri triangle. There's environmental components, there's economic components that are in there. And then I think there's also kind of that social component with, you know, food security and lots of issues like that that kind of come into play as well. Thank you, Randy. And I'm, a, and I'm, and, and also thank you very much for the offer to, you know, to um, directly engage with the, with the school sites that are interested and provide that support. And also, um, I am gonna put in here as well, you may have it linked in some of the other documents. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat. Um, so with FDACS, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer, uh, is it services or sciences? Um, there is someone that's engaged with, if, if you're really interested in composting, and the, the school administration is uncertain on, on what's allowed from like state level, that type of thing. Um, there are resources um, through, the, through FDACs. And so it's listed online. And when you go to that site, you can scroll down and it specifically says food recovery in schools. And sometimes it might be something as simple as, um, you know, gleaning that food waste and when you compost it, then applying it to your landscape plants instead of to your vegetable plants, but you're still diverting that food waste um, and, and, and making good use of that. So there's additional resources. So, um, so between Randy and then um, the, the state level as well, um, it can really help. And it was, Randy, I have to say it was really exciting. I'm getting a chance to touch base with some teachers that are um, newer to the school garden, newer to the compost uh, type of situation at their school. So it's, um, so I apologize, I've been a little distracted in the chat. Yeah, and it looks like in the chat, somebody had said they ran up against some of those administrative type issues, which is very common. Um, I only know a few schools that are actually, you know, having some success with that. Um, the Out of Door Academy on Siesta Key has, has some composting there that we were out and helped them. You know, Macintosh Middle, uh, a lot of the um, like daycare centers, a lot of those type of places, uh, nursery type schools, they, 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 they're able to do that. They're more of a private business side because of that. But when you are, you know, a state funded school, there seems to be some more hesitation with kind of the public schools to put those in place. So it's, you gotta really tie it into your curriculum and make it part of that larger school garden, science, you know, all, all those components in there. Um, and then Deb Walker said that she had some trouble with oak leaves and pine needles, they took forever. 
Yeah, they, they can. That's why we always say to put a mixture uh, of uh, material in there when you can. You don't want to just use all one item like, like the pine needles because they're not going to break down. Same with like palm fronds and things that are very fibrous. They just take a longer to break down in, in there as well. But it sounds like they are composting at her school. I'm not sure where that is, but that's exciting. <laughs> She's um, with SMA Prep. And so I put her um, her website into the chat um, since we do have some newer teachers um, and maybe some master gardeners that aren't as familiar. Uh, Deb does a really great job um, sharing information as, as she's going. So she has a lot of useful links and things and she's done uh, growing with, um, you know, with NASA program where they try uh, different crops and stuff like that. So, um, so it's, a, it's worth a visit to that site, especially if you're working with middle school or um, upper level elementary uh, to glean some ideas too. Oh, um, Deb Walker, oh dear, better update it. You're, you're still pretty up to date. Uh, your page is probably more up to date than mine, so hats off to you. <laughs> um, so, I, and then if anybody else has some other information to plug into the chat and, um, and Randy, um, did you want to, can you put in the chat again, your, um, your email address, yep. and then I'll also try to share that out with your references and it's, um, significantly sized file. So I'll see if I can put them in a, in a shared place where I can, um, Send them uh, out in email without breaking it. Yeah, I, I broke it up into a couple emails. I think I, I couldn't find them. I'm sorry about that, or I would have oh. done, done that. But uh, I, I would definitely try to do maybe two each for each, you know, two or three emails. All right. Well, I you're off the hook. I didn't go the full hour, so that, that's good. That's good. So you got time to grab another cup of coffee and, and all those good things. Well, I would ask if anybody does have any questions. I can actually, let me see if I can pause the leftover uh, and kind of break those up and, and mix them in. Um, we used to, at the bigger bins at the office, we had larger bins and we would actually feed, uh, go to Detweiler's and get uh, a bunch of, you know, a lot of food with that and they would process it very quickly, but that was much larger scale. But just with your small bin, You'll, you'll, as you go through it, you'll notice um, it, how quickly they're breaking it down. If you, if they're not breaking it down um, in, a, in a pretty good rate, you may have, you may not have enough worms in there for the food or, uh, and so it'll be kind of left over and get kind of messy on you. Um, so when you get started, you'll need to do that. The other thing is they're going to reproduce in there, you know, every 45 days or so, they'll start to, you'll start to see, uh, you know, a, an increase in worms uh, in there. And you can actually see the little eggs if you get in there real close and look at them and you'll find little small babies in there and things like that. So there might even be a point where you have too many in your, in your bin. It might just be kind of overrun and you can, you can create multiple bins that way or share them with your neighbor or something like that. Um, but there's lots of different processes to go through. Um, with the and it's, it's neat that you were mentioning about the earthworms um, and uh, reproduction. I know that I was doing um, a webinar and it was like a parent that was uh, gardening at home with her kids. And so they were experimenting um, like what methods and the kids were counting their worms, <laughs> you know, the siblings kind of competing. Yeah. With it. And yeah, so I have, a, I have a live class scheduled for August 23rd, maybe 24, somewhere in that range okay. on Eventbrite. I uh -huh. don't have to make up, but I, I'm keeping it to about 12 people to sign up. And eventually we're going to have, it, it, it'll be free, but I, I have a number of the county bins set up and I'm, and I ordered some worms. So if you want to start a, a vermiculture program, um, you can sign up with there. I'll give you the bins. You'll have worms and we'll get it set up. That's kind of only happening for the first group, I think, because I don't have enough materials after that. Um, but uh, that might be a good opportunity. I just put that up the other day and nobody had signed up yet, but I'm sure they will soon. Yeah. And depending on when in August, if schools have already started, um, maybe have a loved one uh, sign up uh, for you. And, and attend. Yeah, that's true. I don't know if school started for people there, but it may have. I'll, but if there's a demand for it from teachers, we can certainly do it one specific for them. Yeah, that would be lovely. 
Um, and then I had asked Wilma to unmute to see if she had anything that she wanted to share about uh, worms. Yeah, for sure. Um, Wilma, I don't know if you can if you can hear us. Yeah, hope, can you. can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying some new. Uh, I can't wear them over my head, so but I finally got ones that work. Um, yeah, what Randy said, I, I sometimes will mix my food up in a blender and I can't use it all at the same time. So I keep a supply in the freezer. So then if I don't have something, I can just thaw one of those out and put it in there. And when it's already ground up, they, it, they go through it really, really fast. Um, <laughs> but it, when he was talking about you can put in too much or too little, if you put in too much at a time and there, there aren't enough worms to eat it all, it just kind of gets really smelly really fast. So you have to be careful that way. And if you're not going to be around or you're going on a month long vacation, just put a whole bunch of extra bedding in there that's really moist, put mash a banana or two in there and, you know, maybe a salad that you didn't eat or something without <laughs> the dressing on it. Um, but, but put enough food in there like that. I mean, not too much, but, you know, a couple of bananas, whatever. And that's enough with that extra bedding for, for a good month. Oh, wow. That's wonderful. So it sounds like, so the main takeaway here is um, we can reach out if we have more questions. There's resources that will be sent to them. And the temperature of the bin seems to be um, more prudent than the quantity and type of food. Does that sound fair? Right. Okay. So, um, and I did put in the chat the link for the event right where you hopefully found this class. So if you did want to um, find any classes by Randy and Wilma, um, you have that there. There's also the web page for um, Deb Walker's uh, SMA prep. Uh, she teaches agri-science and has lots of great links and information on there. Um, and then also the FDAX um, food recovery in case you need additional information to take to your administration to support your efforts with composting. So, um, and then I think we are all set. And then the next session is going to be teacher speakers. So we have uh, Laura Kemble uh, joining us from Cranberry Elementary um, and then Mary Sanchez from Inglewood Elementary. And then hopefully also um, one of our teachers out of Ashton Elementary uh, to, to be on the panel. So it should be a fun time. So thank you so much, Randy. I really appreciate yeah, it. Was, somebody um, asked, somebody yes. asked how they use worm castings just as a last thing. Um, yes. Yeah, ju just as you would, it, like you would use compost. It's, it's just a nitrogen rich material. Um, it's actually, uh, when you compare it to regular uh, compost, the traditional hot compost, you know, it is, you know, four or five times stronger as far as the parts per million of, of the, uh, the nitrogen. So it's like a, a super compost, really. A lot of people who do starts or they start their plants and seeds and things like that like to incorporate and use the, the compost. It really gets them going, um, the plants going quickly. I used to just take my excess because I didn't know what to do with it. I had a bunch. I would put it in our raised beds there at the office. And it, it I appreciate stuff, it. <laughs> everything just grew crazy. I re it really got, once you, you kind of mix it into the soil that's there, it just really creates a nice material, um, a great yeah. environment. And it helps retain water too. So that's a big thing, Susan, is, you know, our soils are sandy. So if you kind of mix that in with some of the, in the ground, it works really well, but it also works great in, um, in raised beds. And, and, we had um, opportunity a couple years ago to get worm, like to purchase worm castings um, in, in bulk from a company um, out of Florida with a good product and the school gardens that were able to use that material. They, it was, it was really um, beneficial. It seemed to really help their soil quite a bit because you do want to replenish your soil when you're growing because your vegetables will pull some of that nutrition. So having things like worm castings, having compost is, is handy. Um, and how do you know when you have excess? Um, you mean excess food or when you have excess worm castings or? Uh, probably excess, water? excess food, I would imagine. Oh. Oh. Well, what well, happened? I think when you, when you said that you had enough that you needed somewhere to put it and so you put yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, so my bins really start, what will happen is, is you, is it starts to break down the bedding and even the uh, the food in there, it'll get really dark and rich in color and you'll start building up and building up in your bin. So there'll be a point where you're like, gosh, I really have a lot of this compost casting in here. 
um, that's starting to build up. So what you'll do is you'll, you, can, you can do two things. So you can use a, uh, a multi-tiered system where you put another hold bin on top and start putting food and bedding on, an, on, on a stackable type system. And the worms will actually go up and eat that food. And then that stuff down there won't have, they'll find the food and the casting below you can use. Or the other thing is you want to separate them off to the side and kind of pull it out and carefully screen that. But it'll just start to build up in, in your bin. You'll st it'll start to fill up and you'll want to use it. Um, Annie's asking about the horse manure. Um, I think what you do at home is going to be different than what you would do in like a school garden setting or a community garden setting. Um, usually school gardens, most of the time they're not going to want uh, at least most of the ones in our district usually don't want manure brought in unless it's something like flat cow um, where it's already like been aged and, and tested and things. Um, and then for community gardens and things, they should be um, only bringing manure in if it's already been aged um, because of food safety. You may be um, wanting to use it at a certain time and using shared tools, et cetera, and somebody else may be at the time where they're harvesting. And so there's a food safety uh, concern there. I don't know about worm. Do worms have desire to uh, eat horse manure? Anybody know? I mean, I think they'll eat it, right, Wilma? But I, I, I shy away from using the. Would you get more flies? Yeah, it, it, than it have to be. Worms? It have to be um, composted. It couldn't be fresh. If it's right. been sitting around for a year and it's composted down, it would probably be good. But fresh would probably kill the worms because there's a lot of um, some kind of acid in there. Yeah. yeah, we get a lot of calls on that horse manure, and I wish I, I wish we still had our ag agent to do something <laughs> also those type of calls. But um, I, from what I've understand, I think you just kind of want to keep it in its own on its own, and and hor keep the horse stuff on, on on composted on site or your farm or something like that, rather than mixing it back in. There seems to be a lot of issues associated with it. And yeah, and, and I know Sarah, um, our former ag agent, didn't set, I don't think she found as much benefit in horse manure as other types of manures, um, like when you're mentioning like rabbit manure, that type of thing. So um, there is definitely um, requirements as far as like aging and temperature and stuff like that. And I can send that in a follow up document um, for you. But I, I tend to play it safe on when it comes to schools and kids and food safety. Um, it I would default to you know what's going to be safest um, in that way, and then what you want to play with at home. Uh, that's that's different. Yeah, definitely keep it out of the school settings. To stick with this veggies and and fruits and stuff like that. Stay away from meats and nothing from an animal. We didn't really get into that, the food and the type of foods today, but uh, that's all part of the, the larger lesson. So, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, I really appreciate your time. We're going to go ahead and take a half hour stretch break, coffee break, and I will see you back. Um, right. You'll want to check thank your you. email for the new link for the show and tell. Each class has its own link. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.